Good morning. <coughs> A warm welcome to, to all of you and special welcome to any visitors who may be with us this morning. There will be tea and coffee after the service, so please do take some time to come along. We have come to worship God and our call to worship uh, is taken from uh, the book of Psalms, Psalm 32, first seven verses. Psalm 32, page 554. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. Happy is the man whom the Lord does not accuse of doing wrong, and who is free from all deceit. When I did not confess my sins, I was worn out from crying all day long. Day and night you punished me, Lord. My strength was completely drained, as moisture is dried up by the summer heat. Then I confessed my sins to you. I did not conceal my wrongdoings. I decided to confess them to you, and you forgave all my sins. So all your loyal people should pray to you in times of need, when a great flood of trouble comes rushing, rushing in, it will not reach them. You are my hiding place, you will save me from trouble. I sing aloud of your salvation, because you protect me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can come to you as your people, knowing that you are there to receive us. At this time, we thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for us. We thank you for each and everything that we have in life. We thank you for our homes, our friends, our family members, our church, our groups that we are involved in, the friendship that we enjoy. Lord, we thank you above all for the for the privilege of belonging to you through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and gave his life so that we may have life and life in all its fullness. This morning, Lord, we come confessing our wrongdoings. We know that we do things wrong. We try to do things in our own ways. But you are there to forgive us when we ask for forgiveness, when we confess our sins. And this morning, we just do that. And by faith, we receive your forgiveness. This morning, Lord, we also pray that you give us strength to honor your name, to praise you with all our strength, with all our mind. May your name be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now worship God and we worship him by singing, We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32 and it can be found on page 99 in the Pew Bibles. The Lost Son. Jesus went on to say, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, father, give me my share of the property now. So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. He went to a country far away where he wasted his money in reckless living. He spent everything he had. Then a severe famine spread over that country and he was left without a thing. So he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. 
He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything to eat. At last he came to his senses and said, All my father's hired workers have more than they can eat, and here I am about to starve. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. So he got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity and he ran, threw his arms round his son and kissed him. Father, the son said, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called his servants. Hurry, he said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Then go and get the prize calf and kill it. And let us celebrate with a feast. For this son was dead and now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the feasting began. In the meantime, the elder son was out in the field. On his way back, when he came close to the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come back home, the servant answered, and your father has killed the prize calf because he got him back safe and sound. The elder brother was so angry that he would not go into the house, so his father came out and begged him to come in. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've worked for you like a slave, and I have never disobeyed your orders. What have you given me? Not even a goat for me to have a feast with my friends. But this son of yours wasted all your property on prostitutes, and when he comes back home, you kill the prize calf for him. My son, the father answered, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be happy because your brother was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. May God add his blessing to his holy word. Amen. Let us now once again worship God, and we worship God by singing Mission Praise number 444, and we sing first four verses. First four verses. The text before us is one of those texts that we are very familiar with, and yet there are so many things or unfamiliar elements that we find in these so-called so familiar texts. And that's the genius of Jesus as, as a teacher and as a metaphorical theologian, the, the, the person who uses these pictures, word pictures, and, and, and symbols to teach people about God. That's what we call metaphorical theologian. And anybody who knows this story knows that we, uh, the, the story that we call the, the prodigal son, would know that each time we read this story, we'd find something different. Now that makes you think about this story. There are many people who consider this as the greatest short story ever written. And again, that gives you some idea about the depth that this story has in itself. Is there something that I have not seen, we might ask? And I can assure you there will be something. Now the context to this story is the chapter 14. You know, just last verse and also the beginning of chapter 15. Now, the last chapter, chapter 14, the very last line says, Listen then if you have ears. Jesus had some, said something previously or before, and at the end he says, 
listen than if you have ears. And then chapter 14, uh, 15 begins with this. Who were these people who were listening? And says, one day when many tax collectors and other outcasts came to listen to Jesus. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law started grumbling. This man welcomes outcasts and even eats with them. And so Jesus told the story. So three stories, back to back three stories he tells. He tells about the, the lost coin. He tells about the lost sheep. And then he concludes after each of these stories, he says, Heaven rejoices over one sinner's repentance. And that is the, 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 the scene that Jesus sets up for this our long story. The term sinners are the, the people in the first three verses we, we heard outcasts, tax collectors, and also the thugs that went along with the tax collectors to collect taxes, as well as the low life criminals and prostitutes that occupied the base level immoral activity in. Israel and in that society. So there are a kind of people whom the rabbis had said, let not anyone associate with such pe people, not even to bring them near to the law of God. That's how far they were kept from God. However, these sinners come to Jesus and they come to repent. This was the work of God that brought joy, that brought the time of feasting. And that's the point of all these three stories. However, Pharisees didn't get it. You know, Jesus was doing the work of God, which is, the salvation or redemption of sinners. And that's what glorifies God. That's the ultimate joy that God receives when someone comes to him and repents. Pharisees, on the other hand, see this work as the work of Satan. And you can send, get the sense how far from God they were themselves. You can't get more far from God than that. I think it's 180 degrees. Anti-mission, anti-evangelism response to Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus, through this story, tries to unmask this anti-evangelism, anti-mission attitude, which is far away from God, very distant from God, knowing nothing of his glory and nothing of his joy, that is the focus of these stories and our reading. The point is, you are so far from God, you didn't get it. That's what Jesus is trying to communicate to the religious elite, the righteous one. God's joy is found in the salvation of even one sinner. That generates joy in heaven. You know, God is not waiting for 10,000 sinners to come and, st uh, you know, and, uh, 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 you know, start the party. He's not waiting for a thousand or even ten. Celebration bring, uh, begins in heaven 
when one lost person comes back to God. So what do you see in this story? Well, I can point out, and you can easily say it, that two kinds of sinners. By the way, I have titled this sermon, Three Prodigals. We have heard about the prodigal son, one prodigal. I've titled it Three Prodigals. Two kinds of sinners, prodigals, and one person who is prodigal in terms of giving away lavishly. And I'll make it clear as we go on. So we see two kinds of sinners. The open, immoral, irreligious sinner and the hypocrite in the house, around the church, around the synagogue, religious, superficially moral. And they're both on the extreme. They're extreme sinners. And a father who entreats both, who offers both everything he has, comes out as a prodigal father in terms of giving out his grace so lavishly, so unconditionally. So there are three prodigals. Two lost, one in giving. The extreme sinner falls within the purview of God's grace. Not everybody is that extreme on the other end, we might say. We are not that extreme, we might say. But that's good news. For all of us who are in between these extremes, each have been given the opportunity to reconcile with God because as I said, both are prodigals and they need repentance. None is better than the other. So what do we learn from this and especially about the father? Now, father really is God in Christ. Coming down from Haman to to, to the earth and seeking those who are lost so that he can give them the opportunity to come and be at peace with God. No, God initiates, he is the seeker. He sees the sinner before the sinner sees him. He finds the sinner before the sinner finds him. You know, when Adam and Eve were thrown out of Eden, it was, it was not Adam and Eve who went on seeking God. God kept following them. He kept seeking them. He went out of the garden with them, a garden with them, so that he can find them and bring them back. And he, the father, in this story, runs and embraces the, the lost son, not caring about the shame he might have to bear in that process. His love is so lavish. What a prodigal father. His pure grace is limitless. And here we see the point. God finds his joy in the salvation of one lost sinner whom he runs to embrace, kisses and restores. You know, we have a lot of, view, uh, lot of views of God. And that's normally, normally not one of them. That you see God as a prodigal father. We are not used to seeing God so eager, so effusive, so lavish, so loving to the worst sinner. You see, the son got it. He got it all. He was reconciled. And why does God do this all? There's only one thing. 
And that is because he rejoices when one sinner repents and all the holy angels and glorified saints rejoice with him. That's when it comes to the point of partying, partying in heaven. And you know, after, uh, you know, you've read verse 32, you're looking for verse 32, don't we, when we want to find out what happened next? What does the older son say about the whole thing? We want to write that kind of ending. We don't find that. Well, how about if we write the ending this morning? You know, the older brother seeing the compassion and mercy of his father, desiring a reconciliation, confessed his sins of hypocrisy and asked his father for forgiveness and, was, and he was also embraced and kissed. And the party went even longer. Wouldn't that be a fitting ending to this story? We would like to see that. But the point is, we can't write the ending. The ending is already written. The ending has already been given to us. Well, you might say, where is that? Here is the ending. Upon hearing this, the older son, being outraged at his father, picked up a piece of wood, so to speak. I would say even stone. And beat his father to death. That's the ending. Rather than receiving his grace. As seeing his own hypocrisy. He goes to the other end. You know it would be only a few months. Before the Pharisees would kill Jesus. By nailing him on the wood on the cross. And they would congratulate themselves that what they had done was an act of honor that protected their people, their nation, and their religion. Last Thursday, we were studying the triumphant entry of Jesus in our Bible study and learning together group. And this is what we see. The Pharisees were so outraged when they saw Jesus entering. They said, did you not see we were not succeeding? The whole world is following him. They were so disappointed. And then they made every effort to to get Jesus arrested and killed. And so they did. They were succeeded in that whole of their effort. You know, these Pharisees, these big brothers, the older brothers, were proud of being saved from that shame that Jesus was bringing to them because he was reaching out to these outcasts. Now, in the language parable, the son was striking, striking the father with crushing blows. Saying, you are evil, you are shameful, you are evil, you are bringing embarrassment to us. And so they killed him. And killed him the most cruel and shameful uh, death they brought on him. And that's how the story ended. You know, and the final irony is that the father who should have beaten the son is beaten to death by the wicked son in the greatest act of evil, as somebody puts it. There was the, the son who should have been punished. Instead, father is being punished for his act of lavish grace. And they thought they were righteous and they didn't understand the love, mercy and grace.
And yet, you know, God, the saving, gracious Father in Christ, uses this murder as the means by which he purchases our salvation, yours and mine. It all ends at the cross where, you know, he in Christ cries out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And through this, he brings salvation, he brings joy, he reconciles us with God. And this, these elements, this communion is the reminder of that shameful death caused by you and me and all the sinners on this earth. The punishment he had, he had taken upon himself, that is what is called prodigal father giving away his grace so lavishly. That's why I think he said, Jesus himself said, because he found it so important for us to remember, he said, whenever you do it, means you partake the communion, do it in memory of me. Come near to him this morning both who had never accepted Christ as their Savior and those who have accepted long time and have gone into the mode of being self-righteous. This parable is for all of us, young and old alike, in terms of faith and even age. Come to him, remembering his death and resurrection, and re be reconciled. Let us cause the joy and noise in heaven. Let us cause this party as we take part in this party. Amen. Let us now bring our offerings uh, to our Lord at our response to his goodness. And as we sing mission praise number 400, we bring our offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our gracious God who is ready to forgive us when we confess our wrongdoings and who is so gracious that he pours out his love on us. We don't deserve it, and yet you're so merciful. And Lord, we are reminded of that love this morning. We come and receive it. We thank you that with that love, you have given us so much. And out of that, we bring these offerings to you. Lord, receive them, bless them, and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our communion hymn this morning is uh, Mission Praise number 723. We come as guests invited. We come to Lord's table and we are invited each one of us by Christ himself so let us remind ourselves as Paul says for I received from the Lord the teaching that I passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a piece of bread gave thanks to God broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in memory of me in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this, do this in memory of me. This means that every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It follows that if anyone eats the Lord's bread or drinks from this cup in a way that, is, that dishonors him, he is guilty of sin against the Lord's body and blood. So then, everyone should examine himself first and then eat the bread and drink from the cup. For if he does not recognize the meaning of the Lord's body when he eats the bread and drinks from the cup, he brings judgment on himself as he eats and drinks. That is why many of you are weak and ill and several have died. If we would examine ourselves first, we would not come under God's judgment. But we are judged and punished by the Lord so that we shall not be condemned together with the world. Amen. Just before we set apart these elements uh, and pray for God's blessings on upon, upon them, let me just clarify one thing which is very much uh, part of uh, a misunderstanding that uh, is there regarding this passage. And that is that when Paul says everyone should examine himself first and then eat the bread and drink from the cup, for if he does not recognize the meaning of the Lord's Supper, or body, when he eats the bread and drinks from the cup, he brings judgment on himself. Many people have taken the view that you need to think about your life and examine that there is no sin in you. And yet before that, you know, until you do that, you should not take part in this supper. And that has caused many people not to take part in Lord's table. That is gross misunderstanding to my view. There is nobody here and anywhere in the world who is free or completely free from sin. We all have sinned and continue to do that. That is not what the text means. It means that if you don't recognize what you are doing, because people were eating just as a food, as a, another way of eating all this and drinking wine at that time, not recognizing that this is a special feast, remembering Lord's body and his blood, then you bring judgment on yourself. So don't keep away your, yourself away from this thinking because I am not completely holy and free from sin and therefore you can't take part in it. This is for sinners to come and recognize his body and blood. Confess and be reconcil reconciled. This is our opportunity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to our Lord's table. Recognizing that this is done for us. Your body was broken for us. Your blood was shed for us. And we come confessing our wrongdoings. Seeking your forgiveness. And as we do so, we set apart these elements. We set apart the bread, the wine, from all other ordinary use for this holy purpose. We want your blessings upon these elements. In Jesus' name, amen. So the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Eat from it, all of you. 
In the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. Drink from it, all of you. The Lord's table is open for every one of us. Take part, rejoice. And can I say, right at the beginning, when the food, uh, the, the bread and wine is served to you, and the session takes it, please take that time for reflection, prayer, so that we can restore our fellowship with God again. And God, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come to your table, to commune with you, to recognize your love for us, and respond in the way that we ought to, confessing our sins and receiving you as our Lord and Savior, committing our entire life to you. Lord, we thank you that your love rejoices us. It gives us strength. It gives us the vision to carry on living life that pleases you. We thank you once again for this opportunity. And we ask this through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us now conclude our service this morning and uh, we sing to God's glory our last hymn in our hymn sheet. To God be the glory, mission praise numbers 708. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all, with your families, now and forever.